I'm Adrian Grenier, actor and advocate. I want to make a climate change film with a difference. I believe that the way we make a better world is by empowering humans. Listen to what the earth has to say, to just show people the humanity and to show people individuals who are living very humbly. The human face of resilience, what individuals are doing to give hope to their communities, to give hope to their children, to give hope to the world. I want to go around the world. I want to meet those humans. I want to highlight that. I want to put a, a lens on that. What? You never seen a New Yorker before? And so, in this film, I'm going to meet the climate change heroes. People just like you and me. People uniting, sharing knowledge, innovating, using creativity to find solutions. And by the end of my journey, I hope to have shown the other side of the climate change story. <laughs> A celebration of the best of humanity, of community, and people coming together to plant seeds of change. This is our story. Great, awesome. I came from New York. Well, New York and everywhere. I was on a plane every couple weeks, traveling around the world. Oh, yes. I was living a life of disconnect. I was living a detached life. Uh, I wasn't present. Growing up in New York, on concrete, detached from the earth, couldn't even see the sky with all the buildings, so I was so disconnected from nature, from the earth. And so I spoke to a healer and she said, you need to ground, you need to be in the earth. I took it seriously and I went and I, I moved, I had a, a little place here in Texas, a, a bungalow here in Austin. And there was a little slice of Earth Excuse behind Excuse the garage. Excuse so I had people <laughs> I was renting the, the, the main house and I moved into that little sliver and I was like, hey guys, I'm gonna just be in the backyard a little bit building this little community garden. And my tenants were like, hey, is he okay? <laughs> Isn't he a big, huge celebrity, a big star? Like, why is he in the, no, he's not even in the backyard, he's in the back of the garage like piece of earth I was like don't mind me I'm just grounding you also jump in the gun <laughs> no <laughs> and uh, I was there for a year getting in the soil getting my hands dirty learning those hard skills working with my hands and shaping the earth and growing something and seeing the tangible result of my effort was the single most transformative thing in my whole life so we're at my home here in Texas, Kintsugi Ranch. Kintsugi is the Japanese practice of mending broken pottery with gold. And it's a, it's a, it's a symbolic um, story that's very relevant to me uh, personally, but also how we approach the land. It's a story of rebirth, regeneration, um, resilience. That which is broken can become whole again. In many ways, the farming practices of the past, using a lot of pesticides, herbicides, um, monocropping, conventional farming, is in my mind broken. So in order to heal, to fix, to um, mend the earth, we need to start 
bringing in new practices, uh, practices of regenerative soil uh, amendment and, um, and integrating various crops, bringing animals back. It's about creating diversity and recognizing nature actually works better when there's complexity and when there's m many different elements contributing into the whole. And I think that's true for humanity as well. So, right. So they've been in for a year or two? A couple years. Part of my own journey is to learn from elders, people who know the importance of restoring humanity's connection with the land and have the wisdom to pass it down. With each other. Parallel to its mother stock. Yeah. Yeah. William Muma, a world-renowned climate scientist, grew up here in Texas. He spent his whole life serving the planet and has done as much as anyone to bring awareness on how we can help heal the earth. I got my work cut out for me. You now. do, you do. <laughs> to me, the model is the natural world. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Speaking uh, my language. <laughs> uh, that the earth is a remarkable living being. In our Western view, humans are separate from nature and uh, we exploit it for our own immediate benefit. Isn't it remarkable? Every animal on the planet looks after its own well-being and in the process creates benefits for every other creature on the planet. When humans do it, we seldom accomplish that. We more often than not degrade the operation of the planet as it affects not only other species, but even for ourselves, and yet we keep doing it. There is undoubtedly ongoing change. Extreme weather events are happening more frequently around the world. I come from a tribal community in northern Pakistan. The temperatures are apocalyptic. This, the 50 degrees Celsius, 122 degrees Fahrenheit, that's the extent of human suffering. It's not one hour of heat, it's not two hours of heat, it's days of heat. I've seen my people suffer. I've seen my people lose their, their livelihood. I've seen their property being swept away by floods. As I tell people, and this is the truth, anytime it quits raining around here, we're about 10 days away from another drought because it just dries up like that. And uh, you can't, if you don't have rain, you don't have agriculture. So it's been a little bit rough lately. It's kind of do or die. Yeah, the, the impacts of climate change has been really severely uh, seen on the ground in Nepal. And uh, the, the impacts of the floods and landslide has been almost a day to day news. In my own home country, Belgium, we have had extreme floods with people dying. We've never seen this before. There have been forest fires uh, throughout the whole Mediterranean region. We have seen um, extreme heat waves. Um, so in Italy and Spain, they had more than um, 35 degrees for, for many weeks. Countries bordering the Sahara, like Egypt, are really feeling the impact. The operating system of the planet is really remarkable. So we've been accelerating our emissions, and that's been accelerating the warming. But the natural system was resilient enough to keep tamping it down and adapting. It kept the temperature level for 10,000 years, really a remarkably stable period. We are breaking out of that boundary right now. We're seeing in the last decade some really severe consequences of global warming. All of that is accelerating. Extremes in weather are becoming more and more frequent. Some may be natural, but since the Industrial Revolution, the burning of fossil fuels by humanity has become the primary driver of rising global temperatures. As our increased population consumes more fuel, more carbon is released into the atmosphere, trapping heat. and the increased temperature leads to extreme weather events and climate chaos.
Despite the chaos, I don't want to focus on the narrative of fear. I want to tell the stories of hope. I believe in humanity's resilience, in our ability to adapt and heal what's broken. Turkey is one place where positive change is happening. I've been invited there to meet the people behind the solutions. Straddling two continents, Istanbul is one of the world's greatest cities, the meeting point between Europe and Asia, where the influences of many empires and cultures still flourish. Through the ages, people have responded to challenges with innovative solutions. Turkey is known as the cradle of civilization and the birthplace of agriculture. 10,000 years ago, it was here that mankind first established human settlements and cultivated the land. Like a lot of countries, Turkey is experiencing changes in a warming world, but it's also finding solutions. The country holds a world record for the most trees planted in an hour and is home to one of Europe's most epic solar parks. So, I've just come with an open mind and an excitement and curiosity to explore the culture. And most importantly, meet the people who are doing things for the better. Every day, 100,000 flights take off and land. Transport is one of the biggest sources of greenhouse gases, accounting for a quarter of fossil fuel emissions. 2.4% of these emissions come from air travel. At Istanbul's Boğaziçi University, at a campus run entirely by wind power, scientists are engineering a more sustainable future for the industry. Working to create jet fuel from one of nature's secret weapons, algae. The team is led by assistant professor, Barat Haznederolo. We work with different algae species uh, that we collect in Turkey. Our work starts in here at really small scales, uh, working on these tiny microscopic organisms that we call microalgae. Algae has an amazing ability to absorb carbon out of the air. In fact, it's one of nature's most efficient tools for carbon capture. Biojet fuel is something that the civic aviation industry is trying to replace fossil-based Jet A1 fuel, which is currently used in the airplanes. The algae are full of lipids, oils or fats, that are used to make the biofuel. The fatter the algae, the more fuel it can make. So the team works to optimize growing conditions and upscale production to meet future goals. So uh, this area is our green glass house. Uh, this glass tubes are, are holding 30,000 liters of microalgae culture. Uh, this particular microalgae species is getting fat, uh, so to speak. Uh, we're gonna extract the oil uh, from these algae. The team's aim is for the biofuel to be blended with traditional fuel in small amounts at first, but eventually rising to 50%. The first move towards this goal will happen later this year, when a test flight using 5% of this blend is planned. Just a small step in a solution that could revolutionize the air industry.
Many of us rely on cars for our daily commute. By 2040, according to projections, there could be two billion cars on the roads worldwide. Combined with road vehicles, they account for nearly three quarters of all transport emissions. Traditional cars pump out carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, but electric cars reduce emissions by up to 50%. Joining the green revolution in a move intended to steer commuters away from more traditional cars, Turkey is launching the TALG, the country's first electric car. Elektrikli taşıtlara dönüşümde Türkiye'nin de dünyadaki e, rolünü üstlenmesi için TALG e, çok önemli fırsat ve bir e, bizim için bir motivasyon. 1.2 milyon metrekareye kurulu e, tok fabrikası e, tam kapasiteye ulaştığında yılda 175 bin adet araç üretmeyi planlıyorlar. We have to change our transport industry, and it's exciting to see seeds of innovation growing. Every year, half a million cars are sold across Turkey. And a recent five-fold increase in electric sales shows that consumers are ready to make the switch to renewables. Şehirlerde yaşayan e, tüketiciler e, ve günlük kısa mesafe araç kullanan e, tüketiciler bence elektrikli taşıta geçmeye oldukça hazır ve istekli. Turkey's vision is to create a network of charging points across the country powered by renewable energy. Ee, geçen yıl itibariyle 3500 adet şarj istasyonu var. Bu yıl 10.000 adetlere ulaşması bekleniyor. When fully charged, TOG cars will be able to travel between 300 to 500 kilometers. Worldwide, there are more than 16 million electric cars already on the roads. And with the introduction of the TOG, Turkey is hopeful to see 1 million electric cars on the country's roads by 2030. Elektrikli araç satışları çok agresif bir şekilde önümüzdeki yıllarda artacak. Çünkü şu anda zaten sayıları çok az olduğu için artış oranları çok yüksek olacak. The trend is promising. Globally, electric vehicle sales increased by 60% in 2022. One in seven cars sold worldwide is now electric. Togun biz kendi yerli ve milli bir markamızın e, lansmanı, bunun başarılmış olması tabii ki e, bizim e, ülke olarak bir hayalimizdi. Bu hayal gerçekleşti. When it comes to lowering transport emissions, it's not just governments and corporations that seem to be steering in the right direction. An ingenious group of students from Istanbul Technical University have designed and created a car that completely runs on solar power. Hello, I'm looking for Reina. Hi, hi. Reina? Reina. Oh, hello. Hi, hello. How are you? Yeah. Very nice to meet you, Adrian. Nice yes. to meet you. <laughs> wow. You guys are getting at it, huh? What are you building here? Our main project is the solar cars. And now uh, this ca car is fully charged by uh, solar car uh, this solar is panels. So fully? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Reina and the team are busy getting the car ready to race in the World Solar Car Championship in Australia. Ooh. Wow. Uh, so this material is some sort of carbon fiber? Uh, we need our car to be efficient, and so we need it to be the lightest it can be. It's incredible. So tell me what I'm looking at here. So that's, that's the battery right there? Yes, it's the battery. Okay, and what's this? Uh, it is used for taking the maximum power from the solar panels. Great. You're doing a great job. This is incredible. So <laughs> Thank you. Let me get, take it for a spin. Come on. Come on. No one's watching. <laughs> Turn off the cameras and no one has to see. Okay, here we go. Here we go, yeah. It's a bit tiny inside. Maybe I'm just a bit too many uh too many Turkish delights. Yeah, but Okie dokie. 
Off into and the future. It's cool to be racing around without pumping out emissions. This car can go up to 140 kilometers per hour. On sunny days, with over 250 solar cells, it can just keep going. And a solar charged battery provides backup power, so when it's cloudy, it can still cover 400 kilometers. Nice. How, How was, was it? the ride? I have a couple of design suggestions. <laughs> Just a couple. But it, it, it was smooth. I had a great time. Yes. I, uh, I, I think I was one of a, a handful of pilots that had an opportunity to drive that thing. And it, yeah, it feels like I've, uh, it's, a, it's a marker. I mean, it's, it's a nice benchmark. Mass use of cars like this that rely completely on solar is still a distant goal. But companies across the world are developing hybrids, electric vehicles with solar roofs that are able to charge themselves while on the road. It seems the future is closer than we think. One thing that separates us from all other animals is that we, we can be imaginative and inventive and manifest our future. So one of these kids, one kid somewhere out there Maybe a kid who's been born today could be the one who's going to invent the next technology that will change everything. There is a transport revolution happening all over Turkey. Electric trains like this one, which travel between major cities, are built here in Turkey and emit up to 35% less carbon than diesel trains. Next stop on my travels is Konya. It's a trip that will take me over 600 kilometers southeast of Istanbul. Turkey A is on a journey to reach net zero emissions by 2053, which means tapping into every available resource. This is one of Europe's most vast solar parks. Built within the footprint of an old lake bed, which ironically dried up due to climate change, the Karapunar Solar Park is the size of 2,600 football fields, an epic symbol of hope and solution. Endless. I need a guide. Who better than Chairman Haluk Kaliunju? Here we have 3.5 million panels. Three, say that again, 3.5 million 3. panels? 3.5 million single panels. Wow. And, and you here in Turkey have a natural resource of constant steady supply of sun, right? So I mean, this, is, this works really well in Turkey. 
and these oil panels are made in Turkey. The country's first solar module factory uses the latest tech to create double-sided panels, which means the sun's energy is absorbed on both sides, increasing efficiency by 20%. They are following the sun. Huh. It directs the sun from morning to until sunset. Very slow. The sun Maybe is right can... there now. Yes. Correct. And it directs with yeah. the sun. In fact, it's yeah. very slowly, like the, in the ancient, the following the, as you know, the uh, sun sundial. clock sundial. Sundial, yes. yes. I am told that at full capacity, the plant generates 1,300 megawatts of energy enough to meet the day-to-day -day needs of two million people. Hello. A logistic challenge for CEO Murtaza yeah, Atta. Be here. So, uh, let me know a little bit about how your project here fits into the larger ambitions of Turkey in general. Our commitment is to reach a zero carbon target in 2053. And this power plant is one of the important assets that's serving that purpose. This whole land, 20 million square meter, once was a lake. Mm. 40 years ago, people used to fishing here. But because of global climate change, this lake is completely dried up. Therefore, we have lost this lake and it had huge impact on the general climate of this region. Rising from a lake bed, this epic solar ocean sends an important message of regeneration and hope. In the quest to reduce global carbon emissions, countries are slowly turning away from fossil fuels and coming around to renewable energy. About 30% of the world's electricity comes from renewable sources, including hydropower, wind, and solar. In Turkey, that figure is much higher at 54%. When I was a child, my mother would tell me stories of the mesmerizing whirling dervishes of Konya. The dance of the whirling dervishes is a form of sema, a religious ceremony. Today, it's still practiced by Sufi dervishes of the Mevlavi order, which traces itself to Rumi, a religious teacher and poet, and follows his work. In the dance, the dervishes reach God by abandoning their egos and personal desires. a narrative that reflects my own journey as an environmentalist seeking to help heal the earth. I'm honored to meet the leader of the Mevlevi Order of the Whirling Dervishes, Fadi Özçekl. I can't tell you how privileged I feel to be here to... Salam. Okay, okay, yes, okay. <laughs> Dervish Salam. Dervish Salam. Dervish Salam. So I'm an environmentalist, and as I travel learning about all of the programs people are using to help the environment, of course I have to wonder, is there any wisdom from Sufi tradition that I might take away and, and learn? <laughs> Kainatta her şeyin bir dönüş içerisinde olduğunu biliyor ya. Dünya dönüyor, dünyanın etrafında ay dönüyor, güneş sistemin etrafında tamamıyla gezegenler dönüyor. İşte insanın vücudundaki kan devamlı bir devran içerisinde insanoğlu ölüyor, topraktan doğuyor, tekrar ölüp toprak oluyor. For me, rebuilding our relationship with the land is key to how we can all heal. I believe 
we need to find our place once again on this planet, instead of trying to control it or take more than the Earth has to give. The destruction that humanity has inflicted on our old growth forests is one example of how we've gotten things so wrong. My, what an incredible tree this is. It's the last of what used to be a whole stand of something like 14 or 15 oaks like this kind. The fact this is the only one left says a lot. It says more than if there were none left in a way because you can actually see what's been lost. This tree is, is, uh, is enormous. I mean, I'm gonna guess maybe 10 tons of carbon in it. I don't know. There's so many branches, it's hard to estimate. Yeah, I'd say at least 10 tons of carbon. That's not in the atmosphere. It's right here in this tree. If we were to cut it down, all the carbon that's stored here would soon or, or later get back into the atmosphere. And so arguments about, well, we'll cut down this one, but don't worry, we'll plant another one here. I'll tell you what, we'll plant two trees here. Three trees, 10 trees. To make up for this, you'd probably have to plant about several thousand trees to have the same amount of carbon. So it's, it's not enough to say, I'm gonna plant a tree when I cut a big one down. And it takes a long time this is 500 years of accumulation. We don't have 500 years to wait to remove more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Plants and trees remove 30% of carbon dioxide that humans emit each year. They play a vital role in cooling the atmosphere by pulling carbon dioxide out of the air and storing it away in the roots, trunks, branches, and leaves. The less carbon dioxide, the cooler the air becomes, reducing global warming. This system is one of nature's ways of keeping greenhouse gases in balance and maintaining a stable climate. Though much more needs to be done, steps are being taken to preserve our old growth forests. And in arid areas devoid of trees, communities are coming together to re-green the earth. I was driving out here and it was totally barren, empty. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this whole forest erupted. And they said we were coming to a forest and I didn't believe it. I was like, where's the forest? There's no, there, it's impossible. And then all of a sudden, boom, here it is. Here in Konya, driven by a desire to put back what has been lost, a coalition of farmers has made a vow with Mother Nature to plant 85 million trees, one for every citizen of Turkey. A mission being coordinated by Dede Urkal. Bu proje 2005 yılında başladı. Konya Ovası bir çöl havasında ağaçların olmadığı bir yer. E biz Konya şeker, torku fabrikası olarak bunu bir misyon edindik. E, Konya hinterlantinin içinde 60'ın üzerinde orman alanımız var. 
e, 23 milyon 700 binde ağaç diktik. Hem bunu yaparken biz e, süneyle bir mücadele, iklimle ilgili e, değişiklik olsun diye ve üreticilerimize de ağaç sevgisini artırmak için hem biz ektik hem de üretici olan 900 bin ortağımıza da ağaç verdik. Onlar da e, o çiftçiler tarlalarına da ağaç diktiler. So tell me a little bit about how this forest has changed the climate, the, the, the local climate. I know you must have new habitat for, for wildlife or for insects. For is it changing the temperature? Is it changing the humidity? Tabi orman alanlarımızda biz habitat alanları oluşturduk. İklimin e, yağışı daha çok aldığını gördük. Tabi e, alanda tozun daha az kalktığını görüyoruz. E, oksijenin daha arttığının da farkındayız. <gülüyor> yani artık siz de torunlarım e, buralarda gelsin gölgesinde e, yaşasın, piknik yapsın, o dilekte iyi tutsun diye Allah'tan temenni ediyorum. For decades, people around the world, just like in Turkey, have been taking action, planting trees on a truly epic scale to help restore the earth. In Northern Africa, the people of the Sahel region are living on the front line of climate change. Their once fertile lands turned to sand by the encroaching Sahara Desert. The never-ending cycle of land degradation and poverty forces many to leave their homes. We see so many young people packing themselves in boats, trying to go to Europe, having to go through very painful stories. They've, their hopelessness is just massive. The people of the Sahel needed a solution, and in 2007, 11 countries joined together and started on a seemingly impossible journey to reclaim the desert, using nature to push against the sand, heat, and drought. Planting one tree at a time, they started creating a forest over 7,500 kilometers long. Initially, the concept was to build a wall, a wall with a width of uh, about 15 kilometers in each country. But now, the Great Green Wall has gone far ahead of that. It has gone beyond planting trees to improve the livelihood of the people there. It is a very ambitious uh, land restoration program that actually uh, seeks to restore 100 million hectares of degraded land. Sequester about 250 million tons of carbon and also creates over 10 million uh, green jobs, especially trying to restore hope and value in, in, in, our, in our young generation. I really believe we are capable of leaving a positive imprint on the land if we re-educate our souls. One man alone can plant a forest. Konya, after suffering an unimaginable loss, Rahim Demir Bash, a grieving father, started to plant trees, not only to heal his own heart, but also to heal the earth. For over 20 years he planted, until he had created a forest.
I'm so impressed that you planted all of these trees. Dünyanın ihtiyacı var. Mesela bunun verdiği oksijeni ta Amerika'daki insanlar da kullanırlar. Ama buraya çeşme yaptırsam ancak buranın bu çevrenin faydalanır. Tanı faydalanır fakat bu ağaçlar benim için her ağaç bir abidedir. Buranın verdiği oksijeni dünyanın her tarafındaki insanlar alırlar. Lise son sınıfta 18 yaşında oğlum kazayla vefat etti. Onun adına bu ormanı diktim. Ben bu yıl mesela 200 200 ağaç dikeceğim bu yıl. E, fırsat buldukça dikiyorum. That's a really beautiful um, honor for your son. E, onun yapacağı bir şey yok. Onun yapacağı bir şey yok. Bir de bizim kültürümüzde şu var yani bizim peygamberimiz diyor ki elinizde bir fidan varsa kıyamet kopacağını görseniz bile o fidanı toprakla birleştirin diyor. Biz böyle bir kültüre sahibiz. Bir de bundan dolayı da biraz daha fazla e, ağaç dikmeye çalışıyorum. Wow. That really touches my heart. And uh, here, your son is here. He, he's here living in with the trees. I, I am so inspired by you because where I live in Texas, I've been planting trees and it is so hard. And so to see that it's possible and that you can actually accomplish this gives me a lot of hope for me. I hope that I can one day say that I've planted 40,000 trees. Okay, we do it. Let's go. Hadi yapalım. Diyatır. Şu can suyunu getir. Şey. Şu kazma nerede kazma? Rahim, like, and I'm, I'm getting a little emotional about it because Too easy. <laughs> I didn't grow up with my father. Okay. All right. And he didn't grow up with his son. And we were able to connect in that moment and bond and connect over something that's so important to both of us, which is the environment, the earth. Yeah, and Rahid, like, I, I, I don't know how he found the courage to soften when he lost his son. I can imagine that that would not be easy. And he opened his heart, and then he followed his heart, and his heart told him to plant trees. There's nothing more beautiful than that. And look what he created. In the volcanic landscape of Cappadocia in central Turkey, over 150 balloons rise with the sun in a celebration of nature's beauty. At some point, we, we, we decided that we were separate from nature. And we decided that we knew more than nature, so that we went in and started to exploit it and treat it disrespectfully. If we can maybe take a step back and recognize that we come from nature. I mean, have you been to one of those balloons? Like, it just changes everything when you start to see the world from another viewpoint. If we can start to listen to what the earth has to say, 
I can't, I can't help but believe that things will naturally improve. I've come to this extraordinary place to find out how people here live in harmony with nature. Cappadocia's distinctive fairy chimneys were formed millions of years ago by volcanic activity. Humanity has also left its mark on the landscape. For thousands of years, the people of Cappadocia have been carving homes out of caves. I met up with hotel owner Ali Yavuz on his family's farm. Did you grow up here or did you buy this recently? No, this was from my grand-grandparents, last 500 years, coming from my grandparents, many generations. Wow. So I want to keep this future generation the same, same tradition. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are still looking after everything. Yes. And we have some, some sheep. What? Never seen a New Yorker before? <laughs> Ali seeks to live a life in balance with the land. Soon they will have a dinner. Cutie oh. patootie. <laughs> he runs one of Cappadocia's oldest cave hotels. If you are living in Cappadocia, you have to live in the cave. Otherwise, your life will be miserable because in summertime it will be very hot. Because it's it's a cave. It, it's a cave, yes. and so it's cooler inside. Yes. In and summer, it cooler. From the cooler. In winter time, when the outside is minus or zero in winter snow, right. inside it's still 15, 16. Right. So, so the caves retain heat. Yes. And in the summer, it retains the cold. Cold, yeah. Cappadocia is not like a Mediterranean or seaside. If there is uh, no rain, uh, nothing, drought, you have nothing to eat. Mm -hmm. So if you are living in Mediterranean, you will go and catch a fish in the sea. So, but mm -hmm. in this area, you have to always work hard and uh, think future. Right. Live in the moment, but think For in future, the future. Futures. Yeah. Ali shows me one of the ways his hotel benefits from the cool nature of the caves. Where we store the, f the fruits and the vegetables. Oh. Like other people here, Ali uses natural cold storage to keep food fresh all year round without relying on an electric fridge. Where we can store it underground, fruits and the vegetables. And we have some honeys from the last summer. And we have tomato paste, grapes, molasses. So which is, pr we are uh, producing on our farm up in the valley. Cold storage, perfect. This is cold yes. storage, yeah. In summer also cold, mm -hmm. in winter also stay damp because these fruits, they like to stay in, inside mm -hmm. and they get more juicy. I want one of these for the house. One of the worst culprits of carbon emissions is humanity's reliance on refrigeration. When fridges are disposed of, they emit greenhouse gases. But the stone landscape of Cappadocia provides nature's solution. It's not just the local community that enjoys the benefits. Beneath Cappadocia is a vast underground network where tens of thousands of tons of fruits and vegetables brought in from Turkey's Mediterranean coast are stored in dark caves, kept cool at the perfect temperature without any reliance on electricity or modern day technology. So, these are the lemons. They're gonna stay like fresh. So we have a ventilation shot and they will have a air circulation. Ali, who has grown up here in this space, in this community, in his own way, trying to maintain the local traditions of cold storage that is hyper-local within the caves, 
which is more energy efficient and more natural and more organic. For him, it, it's important. And that is, I, that's who I look to, to inform the way I, I make my choices. The people of Cappadocia are using ancient wisdom to adapt to a changing world. And they're not the only ones. As the climate is warming, natural resources like water are becoming more scarce. Rising to meet that challenge, people across the world have found ways to work with nature to help build resilience for the future. In Turkey's Aegean region, in a village in Aydin, when olive trees started to die due to drought, farmers turned back to traditional techniques. By repairing and modifying ancient stone walls, farmers make sure that when rain does come, the flow of water is slowed and redirected to the base of their olive trees. Without the walls, the rainwater would flow down the valley and be wasted. The method may appear basic, but similar practices were used by earlier generations to help keep their olive groves healthy for hundreds of years. Most of the villagers have lived here their entire lives, like village elder Mahmed Korgmaz. Organic materials are in the Kalio. Hem de Yamur Suna, O Topra Emdrius, Hem Arch, Hem Bitki Burda, Daha Guchlo. Bo Yamur Suna Yerenda Topra Emdrius Old Domes Ashtarin, they are learning to use the Elda Fazda Zetin Vedeni Gurd, Gurzam Medic. The best ideas are often the most simple. Making the most of the resources we already have can help us all adapt. And that's a philosophy that's already making a difference in my home city, Austin, Texas, where water conservation plays an integral part in the design of the city's central library. Water expert Charlene Lurig advises on sustainable planning. So Texas is on a trajectory to double its population in the next 30 or so years. A city that's growing is going to take more water from a finite supply is the way we typically think about what a city is. But if you come to a building like the one we're in today, Austin Public Library, you see that actually buildings can be a reservoir of water. One of the biggest supplies that we have yet to tap into as a state is air conditioning condensate. When you run an air conditioner, it condenses the water out of the atmosphere. Air conditioning condensate is actually a huge supply of water. So we're talking millions and millions of gallons every day that are produced within this city. So we're up on the rooftop garden now. It's 100% rainwater fed. It's actually an enormous filter that filters the water that's then captured underneath by a cistern, which is part of the building's overall water storage capacity. So the rainwater that comes in will get blended with air conditioning condensate, and it'll be used for outdoor gardening and also for indoor toilet flushing. 
actually you can build your way into resilience. You know, as a mom of a seven-year-old, I often find myself struggling with what I can really do as one person among eight billion. Um, one thing that I did and that gives me some comfort is to lead the water plan that will carve a pathway to more buildings like this being part of the solution. That's just a piece, right? It's not, it's not the solution. But what can I, as one person, do if I can help people open up their eyes to ways that we can live lightly on the land and lighter with each other, to be caregivers and collaborators, people who help other people get water rather than to take water from people, then, you know, at least I can look my daughter in the eye Our ability to use our ingenuity to adjust is key in a changing, drier climate. With the population set to reach 10 billion in 30 years, one of the biggest challenges humanity is rising to meet is how we can feed that growing population. Across Turkey, squeezed into industrial areas in cities like Istanbul, urban farms that use 95% less water than traditional agriculture may be part of the solution. So I, I'm a huge fan of vertical farming. Uh, I've been following it for years as the technology improves. Uh, I know there's something that's it doesn't feel romantic about it. You know, there's nothing like seeing the image of a farm out in the wild. But there's something that's also really beautiful about being able to create a huge amount of food in a small footprint, especially in cities. This urban farm was started seven years ago by co-founder Halil Beautiful. I was not expecting to see that here. It's like nested away inside all the buildings. And we are producing a crop without soil and without sun. This tiny footprint can produce over 4,000 crops a week. And a new facility, 10 times the size, will be opening soon. Every year, we are going to pro produce a 900,000 plants a year. Come Nine, at 900,000. 900, yeah. Wow. Yeah. What about the electricity? What about all the lights? Isn't that a trade-off? There is a, a solar panel upstairs, so we are trying to find a way, to nature a way to uh, use fine hours in uh, electricity. This controlled environment allows vertical farms to grow crops all day, every day. They don't have to worry about the bad weather, seasonal changes, or pests. And growing inside the city, close to where the food is needed, reduces waste, it cuts transport, lowers emissions, and means less plants perish en route. As much as I really love traditional farming, getting out into the soil, into the open natural sun, uh, there's something so important about using our human ingenuity and technology to actually grow our way out of many of the world's environmental problems. Reinventing how we grow our food is one way we can reduce our waste and the emissions we create. But there are many other things we can all do. In today's consumer-driven world, we've grown used to a disposable society. Every year, humanity generates more than two billion tons of waste.
As the waste rots in landfills, it gives off methane, a heat-trapping gas even more potent than carbon dioxide. But we can choose to be less wasteful. I've been doing environmental work for a long time, 20 plus years now. I was living a very indulgent life. I wasn't practicing much of what I preached, but I was so invested in telling other people how to be that I forgot about how to recognize what impact I'm actually making personally, right? So I've chosen to change my direction so that I can start making wiser choices. Morning. One person working to help us face up to the reality of our choices is Istanbul artist Danis Sadic. Raised as part of a nomadic family, she knows the value of a sustainable life. Hello, Denise. Ah, Adri. Please. Hello, hello. These are beautiful pieces. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very <laughs> impressive. Ah, so I understand you make these with waste. Yes, oh, yes, only with the material. And every piece is a different material. Yes, uh, for example, cable tie. So it's all waste, everything? Oh, everything, every material, waste. Wow. I use only waste material. Buradaki parçalar ise elektronik devre atıkları. Yine buradaki gördüğünüz ise tarihi geçmiş olan ilaçlar. Burada plastik poşetleri kullandım. Etrafa ve doğaya en çok zarar veren materyallerden biri de. What, why do you use waste? What's the reason? Çok fazla tüketim çılgınlığı var. İnsanlar hemen alıyorlar, kullanıyorlar ve çabuk vazgeçiyorlar ve atıyorlar. Ben bu atışa dur demek için ve bunların aslında birer ham madde olduğunu gösterebilmek için eserler yapıyorum. İnsanlara ilham vermeye çalışıyorum. Bu da demek oluyor ki daha az tüketim, daha az tüketim, daha az karbon emisyon. Ve daha fazla güzellik demek. <laughs> so are, are the, is this work a message of hope or cynicism? Uh, hope. Hope, hope, hope. Because uh, uh, bu dünya hepimizin ve herkesin bir adım atması gerekiyor. People may ask, you know, why art? I and mean, this is recycling or using such a small amount of waste. But there's so much more to life, so much more to humanity to communicate ideas and beauty and vision. And if you look clearly, this art is full of passion. So art is so important for us to express a North Star for culture. Denise is part of a growing movement I've heard about across Turkey, working to change society's attitudes and educate people about the benefits of a more circular economy. So they reduce, recycle, and repurpose what's used. It's a message that is being shared with the next generation through events like Turkey's Zero Waste Summit, led by Turkey's First Lady Emine Erdogan. The people of Turkey seem to have embraced a new circular future. I've been told that in the five years since the initiative was launched, over 24 million tons of Turkey's waste has been recycled or repurposed. Önce 
bu topraklarda umutlarla ektiğimiz tohum, bugün gölgesi en uzak ülkelere kadar ulaşan büyük bir çınara dönüşüyor. Bu başarı öncelikle sıfır atığı bir hayat felsefesi olarak benimseyen ve gönüllü katkıları ile zenginleştiren halkımızındır. Ne güzel ki. Two hours outside of Istanbul, one man is transforming mountains of waste. Zafer Kaplan is a textile engineer who is on a mission to change his industry. So environmental impact of the textile is really very huge. Almost uh, second biggest pollution making industry in the world. So fast fashion came into our life almost last 50 to 60 years ago. And uh, the impact of this fast fashion uh, to produce very cheap, very affordable prices, uh, and then they use as disposable items. Globally, an estimated 92 million tons of textile waste is created every year. Zafar is taking our second-hand clothes and giving them new life. Half a million garments each day not ending up in landfills. In a process of regeneration, the clothes are returned to their fibrous form and reborn as yarn. We are the largest recycling uh, or regenerated yarn production uh, facility in the world. We are processing almost 150 tons of recycled yarn per day. and 30% of this process is powered by the rays of the sun. Just down the road, Zafar has built Europe's largest plastic bottle recycling factory that turns plastic into polyester fiber. So we are actually processing almost 15 million plastic bottles per day. Almost 20 trucks of uh, bottles we are recycling every day. Having uh, those bottles from Turkey, yeah, as well as we receive from United States, from Canada, from European countries, from African countries, almost all over the world. The millions of plastic bottles are shredded and turned into flakes, which are melted and transformed into polyester fiber. So for one t-shirt, uh, approximately we need uh, six plastic bottles. And for a pair of trousers like jeans, we need approximately 20 plastic bottles. So I'm very much hopeful about the future of textile business because uh, all the brands, uh, either fast fashion or high brands or other textile manufacturers or retailers are aware of the situation, which is not sustainable at all. So they are changing uh, the designs and they are changing also the sourcing or the raw material. They are in the aim of using more recycled content. If we all make considered choices about what we buy and repurpose or recycle as much as we can, we will have a positive impact on our environment, including helping to preserve our oceans. Here on the banks of the Bosphorus, the legendary waterway that separates Europe from Asia, I think about my love for nature, and in particular, the much neglected oceans.
I remember doing a scuba dive cleanup, and there's so much plastic that you don't even see at first, but it's sort of become just embedded with the environment. Um, so if we can start to restore those ecosystems and clean up a lot of that plastic, let it heal, let it regenerate, because it will. It's very resilient. The ocean is vital to all life on Earth. Ocean waters are full of phytoplankton, microscopic organisms, invisible to the naked eye. Just like plants, they convert sunlight into the energy they need. The ocean is also home to coastal ecosystems, mangroves, sea marshes, kelp, and seagrass habitats. Together, they produce over half the oxygen we breathe and absorb almost a third of the carbon in our atmosphere. And when it comes to carbon capture, one plant in particular has serious superpowers. Despite its humble appearance, seagrass can absorb carbon up to 35 times faster than any tropical rainforest. Preserving seagrass habitat is vital to the health of the ocean. Along the Aegean coast in Izmir, scientists like Argen Tashkin are taking up the challenge. Aslında deniz çayırları iklim değişikliğinde karbonu tutma kapasitesi açısından, karbondioksit kullanıp oksijen üretmesi açısından oldukça önemli birer biyolojik element olarak bulunmaktadırlar. Ormanların gelişmesi, o süksesyon dediğimiz olay, klimaks evresine varması 100-150 yıllık bir süreç içerisinde gerçekleşmekte. Denizel ortamda ise denizel bitkiler açısından, deniz çayırları, deniz makro alpleri ise bu birkaç yıl içerisinde gerçekleşmektedir. One of Ergen's aims is to replant seagrass in protected areas. kadar e, tüketim e, çevreyi tahribat e, ve e, kirlilik arttıkça e, maalesef iklim değişikliğinde diğer sorunlarla birlikte iklim değişikliğinde meydana getirdi ama yine de çözüm insanda kesinlikle ben buna inanıyorum Ergun is not alone in his work to preserve ocean ecosystems. Marine biologists working in the Marmara Sea, off the coast of Istanbul, are battling to protect some of the ocean's most iconic habitats, coral reefs. Their work is led by Associate Professor Nur Adar Topçu. The oceans are um, where we should all focus talking climate change. But unfortunately, this is not the case. This may be because people don't go down uh, into the ocean and they don't see what we see. Corals are an important uh, source of biodiversity. Oceans are where the uh, heat and uh, the energy gets absorbed. Of course, they, they are also a sink of carbon. Uh, corals, they are animals, and they have a skeleton made of calcium carbonate, so they take carbon dioxide. They are the most vulnerable uh, organisms when it comes to climate change. When exposed to stressful conditions, like warming waters or pollution, corals expel algae, turning white, a process known as bleaching. If the stressful conditions persist, the corals die.
Transplanting healthy corals could be one way to help reefs survive. In 2017, the first transplantation of its kind in Turkey, Edda's team, working with the Marine Life Conservation Society, transplanted hundreds of corals in the Marmara Sea in a bid to turn back the tide. We are not alone on this planet. We are not the owners of the planet. So uh, we have responsibilities, I think, uh, as we use the oceans. We have responsibilities, but we have to protect these organisms. One of Turkey's biggest ocean advocates is free diver Sharika Arjuman, who has a unique relationship with the ocean. So, Shaika. Yes. And I hear you are the world champion, or you hold a record for freediving. Yeah, I have free diving. Free diving several world records. Several world yes. I, I stand corrected. <laughs> that is amazing. How long can you hold your breath for? Uh, six and a half minutes. I'm really in love with the ocean. I feel like ocean is my home, so I do my best to protect it. But in the recent years, I really do swim a lot of, with a lot of plastics around, which is really heartbreaking. And on the surface, whatever we see is only 15% of what's happening down there. There is a lot of pollution under the water, everything, like um, sofa, tires, plastic bottles, of course. I just want to encourage people to not to produce that much waste, and we should let ocean do the job. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we cannot even breathe. How old were you when you first realized that you just needed to be under the water? Yeah, I think it was 12 because before that I used to have asthma and I even couldn't go to the school. So when I hold my breath under the water, I felt really that I can inhale actually. It helped for my school, for my health, everything. Back to life, actually. My aim was not just doing world records, my aim was just to be able to breathe, actually. It was not just metaphoric uh, saying when I said, ocean gave me my breath back. The ocean gives us every other breath. Exactly. And so we need to help the ocean, otherwise we can't breathe. I have no doubt that saving our oceans will take a global effort. And that's also true for the bigger picture. For years now, scientists have been arguing that humanity needs to change its ways. Governments finally got sufficiently alarmed that in 2015, they set a goal of not allowing the world's average temperature to rise more than one and a half degrees Celsius. There's no technological reason and no biological, ecological reason why we couldn't meet it, it's just we're failing to do so. Today we're at 1.2 degrees. I know that by letting more forests grow, we can make a huge difference. I know that by shifting away from fossil fuels as rapidly as possible, we can make a difference. The sooner we, we, we uh, ramp down the amount of, of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere like carbon dioxide, uh, the sooner that uh, we will reduce the intensity of these storms, the frequency of droughts and wildfires. So it's really very much worth it in the lifetime of people who are alive today to make the difference. The question is, are there enough people willing to stand together and make a change? For me, from what I know, from what I've seen, the answer is definitely yes. The collective action needs to go beyond just leaders coming together once a year, and we need coalitions of the willing. The role and contribution of indigenous peoples for sustaining the ecosystem, biodiversity, and nature is very, very pertinent. We would like to bring hope of our future generation and they balance their indigenous knowledge with science knowledge you know, to deal with the climate crisis. It's going to take a lot of effort and a great deal more love than ever before. 
but it is possible. We are a miracle of a species. If any species can do it, it's us. I tell every young person I meet nowadays that as of now, your citizenship of planet Earth supersedes your citizenship of your country, whether you're an American or a Bangladeshi or a Nigerian, you're a citizen of planet Earth. Now more than ever, humanity has so much to learn from generations that have gone before. Valuable wisdom to be passed down to the next generation so they can carry on the healing. Finding ways to engage with and inspire young minds is exactly what some new friends of mine are trying to do. Using music to help children see the value in things they might otherwise throw away. Fungus Dumble plays instruments made of trash. special guest from Texas. Hey, Adrian, please come and join us. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is so incredible. We have a very interesting instrument for you. <laughs> yeah. We are playing on the stage. Well, yeah, finger could be easier for you. Which one you prefer? All right. Ah, yeah. Wish me luck. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well and I feel so grateful that I've gone through the changes that I have so that I can be a, a better role model I know life is hard and I know it's not without challenges but that's why it is incumbent upon us to face what is hard and to have the courage to confront the challenges so that we might heal the world so that we might overcome so this is an opportunity for all of us. It's a call to action for all of us to show up. Every documentary is a process of discovery. You know, sometimes you may think you know what story you want to tell, but then the subjects and the, the landscape and the filmic experience changes you and changes the story. Uh, and you have to be open to responding to what the story wants to be. And when I first started this project, I thought it was a climate change documentary. And what I realized is it's a story of human resilience. And it's the, the human face of climate resilience. The, the environment's changing, climate is changing. But if you look around, humans are adapting, humans are responding, humans are creatively changing 
to meet the moment. And that is, that's, that's uh, encouraging. where we live, we can all make a difference. <laughs> <laughs>